and then we will get going. Great. Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome today. We have a very, very large uh, room of participants uh, that we are super excited for. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I will do a very quick introduction and we'll get the program uh, rolling substantively. So welcome. This is the first seminar in a new series hosted by the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime and Security at Osgood Hall Law School of York University in Toronto. My name is Heidi Matthews. I'm an assistant professor at Osgood and also the co-director of the center. The center works to facilitate a cross-disciplinary program of research and project initiatives that enhance knowledge of issues related to a variety of transnational phenomenon that are rapidly changing and challenging society, law, and governance. The series that launches today is titled Legally Radical, The Role of Law in Emancipatory Struggles and advances our mandate insofar as it critically challenges a core question animating transnational rights research in the context of the COVID-19 landscape, namely whether and how law can advance campaigns of public health and community level protection without reproducing unacceptable structures of individual and collective subjugation. Their series is conceptualized and organized by our visiting fellow, Emilio, Emilio Dabed, along with Tessa Marie Grossi, El Hambegi, and Leila Shafi. We are delighted to welcome today's featured speaker, Jessica White, who is author of The Morals of the Market, Human Rights, and the Rise of Neoliberalism, published in 2019 by Verso. The Thank structure. You, <laughs> Thanks, Jessica, for being with us. Pleasure. The structure for today will feature remarks from Emilio on the objectives of the series, followed by a little bit of housekeeping and then commentary on Jessica's book by Elham. We will then turn to a presentation by Jessica and finally open it up to the group for a question and answer period. Before we get going, uh, I do want to do what we traditionally do when we meet together in person for events at the center. Um, and that is our practice of acknowledging the land where Osgood Hall Law School is located and the many indigenous nations that have lived there and caretaken it and who continue to do so. We reflect on the connections, the fellowship and the responsibilities that come with studying and teaching law in a territory where complex systems of governance morality and pedagogy have long been practiced and are indeed inextricably tied to the land itself. Osgood is located in the area known as Takaronto, and I want to acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Métis, and the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land is now home home to many Indigenous peoples and is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I'd also like to acknowledge the land that I currently find myself on, which is situated in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, including the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inui of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Emilio, and thank you everybody for being here once again this afternoon. Great, thank you so much, Heidi. Um, well, hello everyone. I'm Emilio Dare, a visiting fellow at Nathanson Center and adjunct professor at Osgood Law School. We are absolutely delighted and so excited to see you all here today. Welcome to our seminar series titled Legally Radical with an interrogation mark, actually the role of law in emancipatory struggles organized by Nathanson Center. I want to start thanking the co-directors of the center, Heidi Matthews and Francois tonguet Renault, as well as the research center coordinator, Liel Gonsalves, for their support and hard work in making this initiative possible. The seminars would have not taken place without the work and dedication of three students at Osgood, Elham Beji, 
Laila Shafi and Tessa Grossi. Elham Beiji is a PhD candidate in legal, legal philosophy. She holds a master's degree in the interdisciplinary studies from York University. Laila Shafi is currently seeking to complete NCA accreditation through her LLM in Canadian common law at Oscott. She holds a BA and LLB from the University of Peshawar, Pakistan. And Tessa Grossi is currently seeking to complete NCA accreditation through her LLM in Canadian common law at Oscott. She holds an LLB from Queen's University of Belfast and she completed her BA in criminal justice and public policy. Without them, oh my God, I prefer not to even imagine. Thank you all of you for all your work. And finally, I want to introduce our main speaker, Jessica White. Jessica is Sancia Associate Professor of Philosophy in the School of Humanities and Languages in the University of New South Wales, with a cross appointment in the Faculty of Law she is a political theorist whose work integrates political philosophy, intellectual history, and political economy to analyze contemporary forms of sovereignty, human rights, humanitarianism, and militarism. Her work has been published in a range of fora. She is the author of Catastrophe and Redemption, the Political Thought of Giorgio Agamben in 2013, and the Morals of the Market, Human Rights and the Rise of Neoliberalism in 2019. She is an editor of the journal Humanity, an international journal of human rights, humanitarianism and development. Welcome, welcome Jessica, we are delighted to have you here. Thank now, you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Now, the seminar has very precise objectives and, and I will try to explain briefly uh, as follows. We think uh, that contemporary politi politics is marked by paradoxical dynamics. On the one hand, we observe the exacerbation of structural violence, military interventions and war, colonial and neo-colonial exploitation and forms of domination, economic dispossession, social fracture, racialized mass incarceration, the criminalization of dissent, and other forms of violence. On the other hand, we also observe an increasing resort to law and the language of rights in order to curb this violence. The paradox, we believe, lies in the fact that despite law playing a central role in furthering these dynamics, Political and social movements formed by oppressed people increasingly turn to law as their primary site for the pursuit of an elusive political emancipation. It is strange to see that people who have witnessed their oppression, dispossession, or colonization organized and reified in law can place so much faith in legality to achieve political emancipation. Now, the problem is not so much the use of law per se, which can have emancipatory potential, we believe. What is concerning is that many social and political movements seem to have uncritically embraced law as their main and sometimes their only strategy. The point is that while we are perfectly aware of the ideological dimensions of law, its masking of real social relations, its capacity to, to articulate domination and its disciplinary effects, we still and increasingly resort to law. There are indeed many works analyzing the instrumentalization of legal discourse and the political cynicism that it can produce, or exposing the appropriation of the language of international law and human rights by conservative actors and state powers to shield their actions from legal accountability while reproducing structures of subjugation. However, we think that for a complete diagnosis of the complexities and tensions that the turn to law implies and beyond instrumentalization or appropriation, it seems that critical legal scholarship needs to pay more careful attention to the very logic that the turn to law imposes and its impact on struggles for emancipation. We need 
to, to undertake a sort of critique of legal reason, asking what law itself does, its language, criteria, standards, assumptions, structures, practices, to our political claims. Important works in the fields of indigenous studies, LGBT studies, labor organizations, uh, organizations and critical race theory identify some of the main problems present in legal logic and the movement's own shift to law. How, for instance, legal logic narrows or channels a movement's demands into terms recognizable to a liberal regime of rights while transforming their political substance and normative aspirations, or how the juridical field turns the affected communities into right holders increasingly concerned with legal technicalities, thereby flattening or erasing an analysis of the relations of law, power, and structures of oppression, or how legal language and discourse favors an uncritical assessment of the kind of victories that law can deliver, thereby obscuring their disciplinary powers and many, many other dynamics. Given this summary diagnosis, in this seminar, we want to explore these dynamics and critiques and try to respond to some other important questions. Why, for example, do we embrace legalism as our main or only strategy for emancipation? How is that we find ourselves demanding from the state and through the law to heal a wound that we know has been often inflicted through the law and by the state? By which logic does our claim for the liberation of human subjects becomes a discursive strategy for legal recognition? How does legality constrain our political aspirations and make us want what it promises but cannot deliver? But also we want to ask, what is the nature of the relationship between desire and law? How do law and its productive and legitimizing powers bring us to desire with such a force things like rights, institutions, regulations, statuses that are not only different from our original political claims, but that very often subvert them. And beyond the critique, the seminar also want to explore what kind of victories does law really offer? How radical can we be through law? Can we advance transformative political agendas and how? How do we, how do we use law while invigorating political and social movements rather than supplanting their role and narrowing their political aspirations? The humble aim of this seminar crucial to legal scholar, law practitioners, and political and social movements is to continue a necessary debate on the paradoxes, ambiguities, and traps that law offers so that our strategies of emancipation do not become technologies of domination. So uh, before Jessica's intervention, Elham Beji will read a brief introduction to Jessica White's work in The Morals of the Market. The introduction is only a collection of, frag of fragments of Jessica's book linked by some of our thoughts about it. So thank you so much uh, for listening to me. Please help Elham. Hello everyone, welcome to the seminar. Um, we are extremely pleased that Jessica White accepted our invitation to open our seminar series because her book serves as a perfect introduction to the problematic, sometimes disconcerting dynamics of law and rights in contemporary politics, which is what we want to explore in the conversation that we're starting today. The Morals of the Market, her book, introduces us to these dynamics by making an extremely interesting and counterintuitive link between neoliberalism and human rights. Yes, Jessica's book does not only tell us a nuanced history showing the permanent dialogue 
that has existed between neoliberalism and human rights, but also and through this history, she establishes a paradoxical conceptual link between them. In her book, human rights are not linked to some progressive political agenda as we often imagine, but to neoliberalism itself. The same phenomenon that large parts of the board population experience as a sort of invisible power dismantling all kinds of non-market forms of solidarity, advancing imperatives that deprive us of the most basic welfare benefits forces that increasingly push the states to govern imposing counter popular policies and delegitimizing alternative political imaginaries. An ideology that, with the objective of imposing and maintaining this world order, harshly criminalizes and represses dissent, leaving the marks of its violence in our very bodies, as has tragically transpired lately in numerous revolts around the world. Think, for instance, of Chile, Lebanon, Tunisia, Iraq, Bolivia, etc. It is precisely in this we think that lies the relevance and urgency of Jessica's work in general and for our seminar in particular. In highlighting the complex relationship between human rights and neoliberalism, the often forgotten or ignored fact that the counter popular neoliberal policies of, la of the last decades have not been advanced in opposition to human rights or in a lawless political space. By counterintuitively linking the two concepts frequently taught up as opposed to each other, the morals of the market draws our attention to the paradoxical fact that David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession. That characterizes neoliberalism and the increasing social and economic equalities, inequalities, colonial and neocolonial exploitation, social fracture and segregation, racialized mass incarceration, and the exacerbation of structural violence that it all supposes, have been combined with a strong growing verbal commitment to liberal politics and rights. It brings back to light not only that law and rights are not necessarily the opposite of violence, as some dominant liberal view would claim, but also the more disturbing fact that extreme violence is inflicted and has been legitimized precisely through a legal human rights discourse. The book argues that the neoliberal regime, far from ignoring human rights, actually mobilizes them to normalize its violence. It shows that law and the language of rights are not at odds with neoliberal ideology, but on the contrary, that neoliberal seems to comfortably speak this language. Neoliberalism has colonized and mastered what Foucault would call the discursive explosion. In the field of human rights that we observe in contemporary politics and skillfully manages to put those rights at the service of its own reproduction. What the book does in an eloquent, well-documented and persuasive way is to call into question the dominant identification or conflation between human rights and justice that we very often consciously or unconsciously make. It does it by establishing two important connections between human rights and neoliberalism, one historical and other conceptual. The historical link begins with a surprising coincidence that some ignore and others forget. In Jessica's words, this book returns to a parallel history, less well noted than the simultaneous rise of neoliberalism and human rights in the 70s, is the fact that in 1947, when the UN Commission on Human Rights met for the first time to begin drafting an international bill of rights, which would become the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, at the same time, a group of economists, philosophers, and historians were gathered in the Swiss Alpine village of Mont Plerin to consider the principles that would later inspire neoliberalism. This history is marked by constant dialogue and debates between neoliberalism and freedoms and rights as articulated in the UN Universal Declaration and other conventions and rights documents. Of course, in the reading of these documents, neoliberals prioritize civil and political rights over social, economic, and cultural ones. But beyond that, Hayek, for instance, denounced that the adoption in the UN, UH, UN UDHR of social, economic, and cultural rights was an incoherent attempt to merge the liberal rights tradition with a starkly different one derived from Marxist Russian Revolution, whose implementation would lead to totalitarianism and loss of freedom. <laughs> 
Confronted with this merging of civil and political rights with economic and social ones, neoliberals did not simply turn away from human rights, rather they developed their own accounts of human rights as moral and legal supports for a liberal market order. And by, so, by doing so, neoliberals contributed more than has been acknowledged to the version of human rights that came to prominence decades later. This was reflected, for instance, in the work of human rights NGOs, such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Indeed, the book shows how these organizations drew implicitly in some cases and explicitly in others on an account of rights developed by the neoliberals since the 40s. And Jessica concludes, human rights NGOs were not powerless companions of the rising neoliberals, but active, enthusiastic, and influential fellow travelers. They pioneered a distinctively human rights discourse for which competitive market order accompanied by liberal institutional structure was truly the last utopia. This intricate and fascinating history that links neoliberalism to human rights needs all our attention. You will find it in Jessica's book. Of course, we invite you to read the morals of the market. Regarding the conceptual link, the book argues that we cannot understand why human rights and neoliberalism flourish together if we view neoliberalism as an exclusively economic doctrine. The morals of the market departs from previous indictments of neoliberalism from Wendy Brown and others for whom neoliberalism's economization of life configures the human always, only and everywhere as homo economicus. That neoliberalism is expressly amoral at the level of both ends and means, and that the rise of neoliberalism is a fundamental threat to democracy and rights. Jessica's point is precisely that these accounts of amoral economism of neoliberalism miss the distinctive morality that was central to its rise, which includes human rights. The founder of the neoliberal thought collective, such as Friedrich Hayek, the German Ordo liberal Wilhelm Robke and others strongly insisted on their conviction that a functioning competitive market required an adequate moral and legal foundation. More precisely, what Hayek called the morals of the market were a set of individualistic commercial values that prioritized the pursuit of self-interest above the development of common purposes. A moral framework that sanctioned wealth accumulation and inequality promoted individual and familial responsibility and fostered submission to the impersonal results of the market process at the expense of the deliberate pursuit of collectively formulated ends. In fact, Hayek urged that conduciveness to that order be accepted as standard by which all particular institutions are judged, including human rights, is in opposition to the laissez-faire policy of their liberal ancestors. But neoliberalism went far beyond and operated another important shift from classical liberalism. Classical liberalism in its contractualist forms or in its more contemporary versions advances the idea of a logical analogy between state and reason and between law and justice. John Rawls, for instance, opens his theory of justice is stating that justice is the first virtue of social institutions. Social institutions, which include the law, are conceived as though their raison d'etre was to fairly settle social conflict and as neutral tools for social cooperation. So while for liberals, the conditions for justice and freedom are the existence of states and the respect for the law, for neoliberals, the condition sine qua non, the categorical imperative for justice and freedom is precisely the existence and respect of the market economy. For them, without the market economy, there can't be a free society. This is one of the main arguments in Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. In summary, for liberals, the competitive market was not simply a more efficient technology for the distribution of goods and services. It was the guarantor of individual freedoms and rights and the necessary condition of social peace. From such a perspective, socialism and social democracy were not merely economic threats to the productivity and efficiency of economic relations. They are a threat to freedom itself. But the morals of the market, according to Ludwig von Mises, go far beyond the protection of private property and freedom of contract that include complex mechanisms which penalize disobedience and recompense obedience to the demands of the labor market. 
Under this structural logic, the individual can only have a market compatible margin of freedoms now reconceptualized as freedom to choose from a tie in Hayek's example to a particular lifestyle. Neoliberal rights are not only economic and legal categories, but also ruling devices disciplining the subjects, literally producing them, governing not only our relationship to authority, but also redefining our understanding of political responsibility, citizenship, duties, rights, individual and collective subjectivities, and identities. For William Rappert, a Swiss economist, director of the Mandate section of the League of Nations and one of the founders of Montpellier Society, the neoliberal collective founded in 47, the necessary international extension of competitive market required the cultural and subjective transformation of non-capitalist societies. It is also required the taming of the state, the disciplining of states according to market compatible policies. This was the logic applied to governments around the world during the Cold War. Jessica takes the example of Chile. We do not have time to explore the Chilean case in detail, and we will only say that her description and analysis suggest that in Chile under Pinochet's dictatorship, the main tenets of neoliberalism were firmly implemented and consolidated. First, private property before and above any other rights. Second, modernity and progress, but only through the market economy. Third, liberty and emancipation redefine a choice of consumption. And finally, the sacred respect of these rules before justice or the idea that justice, has free, justice and freedom are precisely the respect of this order. In Chile, Jessica says, constitutionally enshrined rights, including human rights, became tools for enforcing such market discipline. The state violence that we observe today in Chile and so many other places can be explained by the fact that the neoliberal understanding of human rights conceives them not so much to protect the individual as to preserve the market order as the very condition of freedom and therefore legitimizing repression precisely in the name of human rights. An early conclusion from Jessica caught our attention as central to this seminar. She says that without coming to terms with these dynamics, social movements and struggles that yield the language of human rights to contest neoliberalism may instead find that they express and it's hold. The story I tell here, Jessica says, is the history of how neoliberal thinkers made human rights the morals of the market. We hope we can discuss this more deeply later. Finally, this introduction leaves aside other important links, links that the book establishes between neoliberalism, civilizational, racial, and other hierarchical political discourse, colonialism, mili militarism, and intervention, authoritarian forms of domination, paternalism, the emerging rejection of colonial guilt, the neoliberal counter revolution and development theory, and human rights discourse. But we can't wait to hear Jessica explaining the various other ways in which her book reflects on the concerns of this seminar. Before I give this stage to Jessica, I just want to ask you that please either direct your question in the chat box in case you forget it by the time of our question period and my colleague will post them to Jessica during the question and answer. Or you can of course use the raised hand feature on the Zoom to ask questions during that time. Please Jessica, the Zoom stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the invitation. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I want to acknowledge before I begin that I'm speaking to you all from the unceded land of the Wongo people of the Eora Nation. And I want to express my solidarity with ongoing struggles of First Nations people of this continent for land and for justice. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you and I want to particularly thank um, Emilio for the invitation and Heidi and to Elham for that fabulous um, introduction to the book and also to Leila and Tessa for their work in organising this. It's really fascinating to hear back other people's thoughts on the book. Um, I've been asked to speak about the themes of the concept note, but to speak about my book in relation to those themes. So one of the first things that really struck me when I read this concept note for the seminar series that Emilio sent me was just how much it was in sync with some of the questions that I was asking when I first began working on and thinking critically about human rights. 
And in particular, I was struck by the extent to which progressive, even left-wing social and political movements were increasingly having recourse to the language of human rights at the very same time that that language was being used by major states and militaries to justify forms of intervention and coercive neoliberal transformation of societies, particularly throughout the global south. And it was clear that this was all taking place. Sorry, I've just, uh, could I I'll put on my speaker view? Sure. Okay. Um, so this is me. Um, okay, so um, it was striking that this was all taking place in the context of a pervasive closure of the political imagination that found its expression in Margaret Thatcher's famous claim, there is no alternative, or in Francis Fukuyama's end of history. And it seemed to me that this rise of human rights needed to be understood in the context of the increasing hegemony of neoliberalism and in the context of an attempt to close off structural challenges to both capitalism and liberal democracy. And yet at the time, the dominant view in much human rights scholarship and amongst many human rights activists and NGOs in the global north in particular, was that neoliberal emphases on competitive markets and austerity were self-evidently at odds with human rights. So as a recent primer on human rights puts it, neoliberalism is one logic in the world today, human rights is the other. So, in thinking about what my book adds to the themes in the concept uh, note for this seminar series, firstly, the morals of the market challenges the idea that human rights and neoliberalism are distinct and counterposed. And it does so by tracing the overlooked place of human rights, not against, but within neoliberal efforts to challenge socialism and social democracy, and particularly anti-colonialism throughout the 20th century. So we've already heard this fabulous outline of some of the book's concerns. And here I just wanna say a little bit more about how I understand neoliberalism before turning in detail to the example of Chile and to the role of neoliberal constitutionalism in locking in deeply regressive economic agendas introduced by the Pinochet dictatorship. So what then is neoliberalism? Um, as Elham mentioned, neoliberalism is commonly understood as an amoral economic ideology, which subordinates all values to an economic rationality, configuring the human, in Wendy Brown's words, as always, only and everywhere homo economicus. So what I suggest in the book is that such accounts of the amoral economism of neoliberalism miss the distinctive morality that was central to its rise. What distinguished the neoliberals of the 20th century from their 19th century precursors, I suggest, wasn't a narrow understanding of the human as homo economicus, but this belief, as Ilham mentioned, that a functioning competitive market required an adequate moral and legal foundation. So the founding statement of the neoliberal Montpelerin society makes this clear. Diagnosing a civilizational crisis characterized by what it terms the disappearance of the conditions for human dignity and threats to freedom of thought and expression, it states that these developments, and I quote, have been fostered by the growth of a view of history which denies all absolute moral standards. So rather than an external supplement or a pragmatic partner of neoliberalism, as particularly uh, scholarship in the United States has often suggested, I argue that social conservatism, including explicit appeals to family values, Christianity, and something called Western civilization, were foundational to the consolidation of organized neoliberalism in the mid 20th century. Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist and political philosopher who founded the Mont Pelerin Society, provided one of the clearest neoliberal accounts of the morals of the market, and I take that phrase, the morals of the market, from Hayek, in his late work, Law, Legislation and Liberty. Invoking the fall of Rome and the thesis of its great historian, Edward Gibbon, who attributed that fall to a decline in ancient virtue, Hayek warned that whether or not Gibbon was correct about Rome, there can be no doubt, in his words, that moral and religious beliefs can destroy a civilization. 
For Hayek, the demise of the morals that sustained a market order threatened his own civilization with destruction. Hayek's account of morals was deeply functionalist. The morals of the market, he contended, functioned to sustain the only order that embraced, in his words, nearly all mankind, the competitive market order. This order, he argued, required a moral framework that sanctioned wealth accumulation and inequality, promoted individual and familial responsibility, and secured submission to the impersonal results of the market process at the expense of collectively formulated ends. Now, as we've heard, for Hayek, given that these moral rules existed primarily to protect the market order, he argued, as did many other neoliberal thinkers, that conduciveness to that market order be upheld as the key standard by which all particular institutions and morals should be judged. So this market conduciveness, I suggest, gave the neoliberals a criteria for assessing claims to human rights that was much more precise than simply a distinction between civil and political rights on the one hand and social and economic rights on the other. Uh, to the extent that such claims for rights supported market relations by protecting property or the freedoms of foreign investors, for instance, particularly in the period of decolonization, the neoliberals actively promoted them. When claims for rights interfered with the competitive market by requiring state intervention and non-market forms of obligation and redistribution, they opposed them as though the fate of civilization depended on it. Now Hayek in particular drew on the social theory of the Scottish Enlightenment to develop an evolutionary account of morality. The evolution from what he called the small band to the great society he argued, required the abandonment of feelings of personal loyalty and egalitarian commitments more suitable to tribal existence. So in this racialized narrative, Hayek depicted his contemporaries' demands for social and economic rights and egalitarianism as atavistic attempts to return from the market society to the morals of the small band. Socialism and social democracy from this perspective were not merely economic threats to the productivity and efficiency of market relations, they were civilizational regressions, or in Hayek's terms, the return of suppressed primordial instincts that threatened the moral foundations of the competitive market. And there's much more to say about the vision of human nature that this idea presupposes, but I have to leave that for the moment. Now, one of the key arguments throughout the book is that the neoliberal argument for the competitive market was itself moral and political rather than strictly economic. For the neoliberals, the competitive market was not simply a more efficient technology for the distribution of goods and services. Early neoliberals attributed to the market a series of anti-political virtues, checking and dispersing power, facilitating social cooperation, pacifying conflict and securing individual liberty and rights. If neoliberal thinkers and human rights activists could find common ground, as I suggest that they could, this is largely because the concerns of 20th century neoliberals were far less narrowly economic, economistic than existing accounts tend to allow. So what do neoliberal human rights do? Throughout the book, I examine the neoliberal understanding of human rights alongside the diverse understandings of rights and obligation that motivated drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the two human rights covenants. For the neoliberals of the time, these documents, lists of rights to social welfare and then national self-determination were threats to the market order and to Western civilization. Yet I show in the book that despite their horror at the collectivism and the politicization in their terms that characterized the human rights process in the United Nations, the neoliberals didn't simply turn away from human rights. Rather, they developed their own account of human rights as moral and legal supports for a liberal market order. The neoliberal thinkers saw human rights and competitive markets as mutually constitutive. In his best-selling polemic, The Road to Serfdom, Hayek argued that all claims made on behalf of the individual can be attributed to the rise of the commercial spirit. The ideas of 1789, 
liberty, equality, fraternity, he wrote, are characteristically commercial ideas, which have no other purpose but to secure certain advantages to individuals. For Hayek and his fellow neoliberals, the competitive market made individual rights possible, but the market's functioning also depended on the rule of law and on what Hayek called the recognition of the inalienable rights of the individual, the inviolable rights of man. Hayek's account of rights owed much to his mentor, Ludwig von Mises, whose 1922 study of socialism had argued that individual rights emerged hand in hand with the development of capitalism. It was only capitalism, Mises argued, that made human relationships material and calculable and brought freedom from the heavens down to earth. Such freedom, Mises wrote, is no natural right. If the market order then is the real basis of all declarations of rights and charters of liberties, as Mises contended, then in his words, as soon as the economic freedom which the market economy grants to its members is removed, all political liberties and bills of rights become humbug. So for the neoliberals of Montpelleron, human rights existed not so much to protect the individual as to secure the market. The neoliberal vision of human rights was at its most powerful or its purest in the period of neoliberal ascendancy. It's clear in Margaret Thatcher's simultaneous denial that state services are an absolute right and her championing of what she called a right to be unequal. And we see it in Ronald Reagan's defense of human dignity as what he termed the crowning ideal of Western civilization. Yet the neoliberal human rights heritage was not only embraced by figures on the right. I also argue that this neoliberal background can shed light on the apparent puzzle that the human rights politics of the late 20th century, with its distinctive use of international advocacy to limit the power of the state, emerged in Samuel Moyne's words, seemingly from nowhere. I show that organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and Medicine Sans Frontieres drew on an account of rights that had been developed by the neoliberal thinkers since the 1940s. For these NGOs also, decolonization generated a desperate need for new standards to constrain post-colonial states and societies. They focused their attention on what Hayek argued was the complement of what he called the taming of the savage, that is the taming of the state. The attempt to discipline post-colonial states held a much larger place in the new politics of human rights than did the concerns of previous decades with economic welfare and self-determination. Although the human rights NGOs came to prominence in the context of the evisceration of social welfare protections and public services, these concerns rarely entered the frame of their early advocacy. I argue that major international human rights and humanitarian NGOs embraced the central neoliberal dichotomy between a commercial or a civil society, understood as a realm of freedom, voluntary interaction and distributed private power that checked the centralised power of the state on the one hand, and politics, understood on Schmidtian lines as violent, coercive and conflictual on the other. Like the neoliberal thinkers, many international human rights NGOs embraced law to restrain politics while avoiding those social and economic rights that could only be achieved through political action, not judicial sanction. The methodology of many human rights NGOs, as Kenneth Roth, Director of Human Rights Watch notes, consists in the ability to investigate, expose and shame, which involves identifying a particular violation, a specific violator and a clear remedy. This has made these NGOs both reluctant and unsuited to challenging the structural and impersonal effects of capitalist market processes. And we can talk perhaps in the uh, discussion about how much this has changed as certain NGOs are more explicitly taking up questions of economic inequality. Then as today, the content of human rights was a product of political struggle. What I call neoliberal human rights are not the only form to have existed historically, and today's human rights campaigns don't necessarily further neoliberal ends. Yet I do contend in the book that the neoliberal contribution to human rights has been far more widely influential than most contemporary human rights defenders would like to admit. 
and not only on the political right or in the halls of power. And so, yes, as uh, Elham and Emilio mentioned, I think that unless we come to terms with that neoliberal influence on dominant conceptions of human rights, then there's a risk that struggles which mobilise the language of human rights end up reinforcing the very neoliberal dynamics they seek to challenge. Now, to further examine this idea, I want to turn now to one example from the book, which I think illustrates some of the paradoxes of the resort to law that the concept note for this seminar asks us to contemplate. And that's um, the example of Chile under the, um, the junta of General Pinochet. So in 1992, the Chicago School economist Milton Friedman was asked about the original purpose of the Montpelier Society. There's no doubt, he replied, that its original purpose was to promote a classical liberal philosophy, that is, a free economy, a free society, socially, civilly, and in human rights. Now, coming from a thinker who described the authoritarian regime of Chile's General Pinochet as an economic and political miracle, this reference to human rights appears out of place. After all, human rights NGOs came to prominence in the 70s precisely for contesting the torture and disappearance that accompanied neoliberal shock treatment in the Southern Cone. Much attention has been paid to the fact that following its 1973 military coup, Pinochet's military junta presided over one of the world's earliest and most brutal neoliberal experiments. While scholars have been quick to note that Chile was an experimental laboratory for neoliberal economic policies, until recently, less attention has been paid to the fact that it was also a testing ground for neoliberal constitutionalism. If Chile today remains among the most unequal countries in the OECD, this is no small part due to the junta's success in consolidating its economic agenda through constitutional means. So last year, as many of you will know, almost a year after mass protests forced the Chilean government to announce plans to revise the country's constitution, Chileans voted overwhelmingly to rewrite the current constitution. Now, here I want to turn to that process of neoliberal constitutionalism under the Pinochet regime and suggest that the pervasive focus on rights and law among NGOs helped to bolster the idea that was promoted by liberal thinkers and neoliberal thinkers that Chile's problem was too much politics and the solution more law. In November of 1973, within months of the coup, Amnesty International sent an investigative team to Chile to report on the human rights situation. When the team, a law professor, a judge and an amnesty researcher arrived in Santiago, the atmosphere of repression was immediately clear. They found Chile absolutely overwhelmed by the military. One team member wrote, there was no rule of law whatsoever. It was just a facade. Amnesty's subsequent reports focused on this absence of legality while avoiding contested political territory. Amnesty described its mandate as working for adequate treatment of all prisoners, fighting for the rule of law, and seeking the release of those it called prisoners of conscience, defined as any person who is physically restrained by imprisonment or otherwise from expressing in any form of words or symbols any opinion which he honestly holds and which does not advocate or condone personal violence. So this was a quite innovative category which was counterposed to the category of the political prisoner precisely through this ruling out of the use of violence. Dismayed by the Chilean Bar Association's indifference to the Hunter's crimes, one Amnesty team member addressed a letter to his legal colleagues, reminding them that Chile had endorsed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and ratified the two human rights co covenants, and claiming that it was unconscionable that these should so quickly be discarded. But the Amnesty team's mandate was strictly limited the revolutionary cause, either before or after the revolution, was none of our business, one team member stressed. The report itself provided an extremely detailed and balanced account of imprisonment, torture and disappearance under Pinochet's rule. It depicted the coup as the outcome, I quote, of an atmosphere of bitter social tension after months of increased polarisation 
between pro-agende and anti-agende factions. Despite asking who are the political prisoners, why are they detained, the report answered neither question, instead reversing to, uh, reverting to the universalizing platitude that the political prisoners have stemmed from all sectors of the Chilean population. Amnesty's 1977 report, which claimed to provide a legal and historical report on the situation of disappeared prisoners, begins with the lines, when the military took over on 11th of September, 73, the junta declared a state of siege throughout the country. Here, the coup appeared as the year zero that began history anew, a response to social tension and polarization whose causes remained unintelligible. Despite the new centrality to which Amnesty elevated the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this taking up of human rights was distinctly partial and emphatically did not include social and economic rights. Amnesty's 74 report on Chile made clear that it would exclude from consideration the approximately 200,000 workers who I quote, lost their employment for political reasons, many of them apparently being reduced to starvation levels. Not only the non-political economic consequences of the coup, but even the use of starvation explicitly as a political weapon was relegated outside the frame of human rights, giving credence to Naomi Klein's account of human rights as blinders, which deflected attention away from the substantive causes of the repression. Now, it could be argued in response to Klein's position that Amnesty's narrow approach provided a politically pragmatic response to the junta's regime of terror, offering more to those subjected to its worst violence than did critiques of economic shock treatment. From this perspective, legalistic human rights activism would complement the goal of leftists who aim to discredit a hated regime thereby promoting what one scholar has called a new, hopefully socialist future. My argument is different. The problem was not simply that the human rights NGOs dealt with political violence in isolation from the economic transformations it facilitated, as Klein has argued. Nor was it that the neoliberals themselves obscured the connection between their economic remedies on the one hand and violations of human rights on the other. Rather, I show that the neoliberals in Chile were explicit that human rights and civil freedoms presupposed a functioning competitive market. So they really tried to unify these things rather than keeping them separate. And if you recall the quote from Mises that I uh, read out earlier, so for him, if without economic freedom, Bill of Rights become humbug, then defending human rights meant defending economic freedom. In Chile, the neoliberals mobilised a stark dichotomy between politics as violent, coercive and conflictual and market relations as peaceful, voluntary and mutually beneficial. It was in Chile that a neoliberal human rights discourse was consolidated, although it had been in development for decades by then. This neoliberal version of human rights justified constitutional restraints and law as necessary to preserve individual freedom that only a competitive market could secure. If human rights were a product of a functioning market, as the neoliberals consistently argued, they were also necessary to protect the argument from egalitarian political movements. Rather than protecting individuals from state repression, Neoliberal human rights operated primarily to preserve the market order by depoliticizing society and framing the margin of freedom compatible with submission to the market as the only possible freedom. Now, in attributing Chile's problems to political tensions and the absence of legality, human rights NGOs did little to contest this redefinition of law and rights as products of a competitive market order. On the contrary, their activism often bolstered the neoliberal dichotomy between violent politics and a free market or civil society, thus contributing to a narrowing of the political and economic margins. The assumption that Chile's key problem was unrestrained political power did not distinguish between political mobilization to challenge arbitrary economic power and authoritarian mobilization to entrench it. Rather, Amnesty's portrayal of politics as a field of tension and polarization 
reinforced the neoliberal attempt to constrain politics within strictly defined bounds, shaping a distinctly non-socialist future. It gave credence to the claim, also advanced by the junta, that Chile's problem was politics and the solution was law. So the story of the institutionalization of neoliberalism in Chile is not only a story of economists struggling to reduce state intervention and secure price stability through massive austerity. It is also the story of an attempt to make explicit what the Chicago School economist Arnold Harberger, who oversaw the Chile project, implicitly recognized when he described Latin American romanticism as the key barrier to good economics. The market requires a moral, legal and institutional order to produce submissive subjects. While the Chicago economists inspired the Hunter's early economic reforms, the impetus for its institutional order came from other branches of 20th century neoliberalism. German auto liberalism, James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock's public choice theory and Hayek's constitutionalism. In contrast to Milton Friedman's often naive rhetoric about natural liberty, these conservative strands of neoliberalism were far more useful to those who sought to bolster the legal foundations of the competitive market. They shared an evolutionary social theory, an attention to the role of morality and particularly Christianity in a market order, and a commitment to using law to protect the intermediate institutions of civil society from political interference. They also shared the goals of the Chicago boys, depoliticizing Chilean society, destroying non-market sources of social reproduction and producing submissive, responsible entrepreneurial subjects. Haim Guzman, who drafted the Hunter's 1974 Declaration of Principles, had been interested in using law to depoliticize Chilean society since his early days as president of the Catholic University Law School Student Union. As a student, Guzman led the ultra-conservative Catholic Gremialista student group, which united with the Chicago boys in 67 to oppose a student revolt that demanded democratic selection of the university hierarchy. Guzman, then a devotee of the fascist corporatism of Franco's Spanish dictatorship and the reactionary anti-liberal Catholic tradition of Juan Donoso Cortes and Joseph de Mestre, was never a friend of democracy. In Chile, that tradition was also represented by Osvaldo Lira, who was an early disciple of Jacques Maritain, the uh, Catholic thinker who contributed much to the early stages of the drafting of the Universal Declaration and who Lyra described as one of the greatest neo-scholastic figures. For this conservative corporatist tradition, the person was enmeshed in intermediate institutions that were threatened by the intrusions of those Lyra termed the ignorant, uncultivated and unintelligent masses. Guzman's Declaration of Principles reflected this tradition by defining the role of social power as securing the independence and depoliticization of all intermediate societies between individuals and the state. That's a quote. It was this goal and a common so-called totalitarian adversary that facilitated Guzman's reconciliation of conservative Catholicism with neoliberalism. The ultimate outcome was Chile's constitution of liberty. In indicting the lawlessness of the junta, Human rights NGOs missed the central place given to law and rights in the attempt to tear up the political foundations of Chilean society. In 1991, following Guzman's assassination on the campus of the Catholic University, Jose Piñera, who was central to the regime's project of modernization and depoliticization, described Guzman as a martyr of the revolution, writing that together, they had fought many battles for liberty, democracy, and human rights. If these men were struggling for human rights, and I think it's worth temporarily suspending disbelief, this was a distinctive notion of human rights for which preserving human dignity required protecting the person and the market from political contestation. Guzman, as his biographer Renato Christi correctly notes, was more than Pinochet's crown jurist. 
When it came to constitutional matters, he writes, Guzman wore the crown. The story of human rights and neoliberalism in Chile is not simply a story of massive human rights violations accompanying market reforms or of the new human rights NGOs that contested the junta's violence. It's also the story of the institutionalization of the conservative vision of neoliberal human rights that first emerged in the 40s. Chile was the testing ground for a model of individual rights that aimed to depoliticize civil society and preserve the inequalities of the market order by protecting the market from the intrusion of the masses. In June 76, Guzman had responded to criticisms of the junta's human rights record by arguing that the theme of human rights is a problem of free modern states. Faced with terroristic international communism, he continued, it is necessary to guarantee the rights of all the persons within a community, especially the majority who want to live in peace. Guzman's understanding of rights gave a neoliberal twist to Carl Schmitt's assertion that there is no norm that is applicable to chaos. If a functioning competitive market is the only guarantee of social peace and human rights, Guzman believed, then it's legitimate to suspend the rights of those who threaten the market order. This is a position we see all through early neoliberal thinking. Far from renouncing law and rights, Guzman was central to the adoption of a constitution that locked in the junta's reforms by emphasizing a version of freedom intrinsically connected to private property, free enterprise and individual rights. Like Hayek's major work published two decades earlier, Chile's, Chile's constitution was called the Constitution of Liberty. Hayek's biographer Bruce Caldwell has suggested that although Hayek's books were in Guzman's library, relevant testimonies doubt that Guzman had read them. Yet in 87, Guzman himself attributed his conversion to neoliberalism to what he called his discovery of Hayek. In Hayek's work, Pinochet's crown jurist found proposals for a constitution of liberty that would protect the market from democratic interference. In his late works, Hayek argued that the spontaneous order of the market required an appropriate legal regime to insulate it from political intervention. While he argued that the rules governing individual conduct themselves evolved through a process of selection, he believed it was at least possible that the rules on which a so-called spontaneous order rests may themselves be designed. So rather than a doctrine of laissez-faire that precludes all constructivism, Hayekian neoliberalism aimed to fine tune rules to secure submission to the overall market order. When asked in 78 whether his account of spontaneous order inherently biased outcomes in favor of past discriminations and past inequities, Hayek responded bluntly, it accepts historical accidents. It was this conservative reverence for spontaneous evolution that made Hayek's thought attractive to Catholic anti-totalitarians in Pinochet's administration and to the traditional Chilean right, who were horrified by the levelling policies of Agende's government. Asked about the vigilante killings carried out on behalf of large landowners seeking to reclaim their expropriated property in the wake of the coup, a Chilean judge showed what was at stake in such respect for historical accidents. From time immemorial, we sat at the table and the maids didn't, he said. People did not want that hierarchy to change. For all his talk of spontaneity, Hayek was convinced that, in his words, favourable accidents do not just happen, we must prepare for them. In Chile, Hayek saw the miracle of a state that was prepared to use its powers to prepare the terrain for such favourable accidents by constitutionally protecting the market. In the Constitution of Liberty, Hayek identified constitutionalism, which he described as the principle of legal limitation of power by higher principles to parliament itself, as the key United States contribution to politics. This principle of constitutionally limited government, he argued, used inviolable individual rights to bind temporary majorities. While the US was founded on a British tradition of liberty, he remarked elsewhere, South America was rooted in the French Revolution 
and in his words, overly influenced by the totalitarian type of ideologies of popular sovereignty. So usually this meant Rousseau when the neoliberals started talking about totalitarianism. In a normal situation, Hayek believed that judicial review would be sufficient to prevent governments overstepping the margin of freedom provided by the constitution. But in a situation like Chile, he saw a crisis that could only be averted by a liberal dictator. During the first of his two visits to Chile during the junta's rule, Hayek spoke with Pinochet about the dangers of what he called unlimited democracy. As Hayek recalls, the general listened carefully and requested that Hayek send any written materials he had on the question. While the Austrian economist might conceivably have sent a large bundle of his writings, his secretary recalls that he asked her to send the chapter The Model Constitution from his three-volume work, Law, Legislation and Liberty. There, Hayek used the term unlimited democracy to refer to what he called the particular form of representative government that now prevails in the Western world. Doubting that a functioning market had ever risen under such a democracy, he also suggested that it was likely that such unlimited democracy would destroy an existing market order. The model constitution also forthrightly defends emergency powers. Freedom may have to be temporarily suspended, Hayek wrote echoing Schmidt, when those institutions are threatened, which are intended to preserve it in the long run. Hayek expanded on these themes in a 1981 interview with the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio. Echoing Schmidt, he argued that when a government is in a situation of rupture, it's practically inevitable for someone to have absolute powers. As the market is necessary to preserve freedom, when the market is threatened, society may be temporarily converted into an organisation and government may rule by decree. He would prefer a liberal dictator, he told the newspaper, to a democratic government lacking in liberalism. Now, this was not the first time that Hayek had expressed sympathy for liberal dictators. In 78, he singled out Pinochet and the Portuguese dictator Salazar as leaders of what he calls authoritarian governments under which personal liberty was safer than under many democracies. When democracies threatened to interfere with the spontaneous order of the market, Time and again, from Chile to Indonesia, Hayek supported brutal dictatorships that were prepared to take all necessary measures to preserve existing inequalities. In Chile, Hayek praised the junta for what he called its willingness to run the country without being obsessed with popular commitments or political expectations of any kind. Coercion was justified, he believed, to provide an effective external framework within self-generating orders conform. The fragile spontaneous order of the market required a strong state to protect it from political interference. James Buchanan, the Virginia School neoliberal, struck a similar note in his paper, Limited or Unlimited Democracy, presented at the regional Mont Pelerin Society meeting uh, in the Chilean seaside town where the coup was plotted. The Virginia School neoliberal criticised what he called the totalitarian thrust of unlimited democracy and stressed that any democracy, any government, sorry, whether a democracy or a junta, in his words, must be strictly limited for the sake of ensuring and protecting individual liberties. Contemplating the return to democracy, uh, a twice Minister for Economy during Pinochet's rule argued that Chile's new democracy will have to be authoritarian in the sense that the rules needed for the system's stability cannot be subject to political processes. The single proactive rule of the state, he contended, would be to enforce market discipline on society. That's a quote. In Chile, constitutionally enshrined rights, including human rights, became tools for enforcing such market discipline. So as I mentioned, this blend of conservative Catholicism and neoliberalism found its definitive expression in the country's 1980 constitution, which combined a Catholic stress on dignity, freedom of conscience, the protected status of the church and the centrality of the family as the basic core of society, with commitments to private enterprise, choice, market competition and human rights. 
Incongruously for a constitution introduced by a torturous dictatorship, its first article was men are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Approved in a plebiscite that was officially described as free, secret and informed, but which was held in a climate of intense repression in which no electoral rolls existed and a blank vote was counted as yes, the constitution provided the blueprint for the junta's protected democracy. America's Watch formed as an offshoot of what became Human Rights Watch to head off claims that the organization was a US Cold War front, concluded that it was not in a position to determine what the results would have been under a fair voting process. But it suggested that even Pinochet's critics have acknowledged that in 1980, the government had an unusually high degree of support, in part because the economy was doing very well. So that's a quote. America's Watch recounted that many had pointed to what it called the trauma of the 1970-73 period as having helped General Pinochet secure approval for the constitution. The claim that the economy was doing very well at the time of the plebiscite tells us more about the class politics of this US-based human rights organization than about Chile's economy. Gallup polls prior to the plebiscite showed very high levels of satisfaction with Pinochet's regime among the upper class, 58.8% of whom described the worst possible outcome of a no vote as a return to the year 1973. But in 1980, real wages were still only 88% of their 1970 level, and unemployment and inequality had both spiralled. Those for whom the economy was doing very well were a small, wealthy minority. In tracing support for the plebiscite to the trauma of Allende's rule, America's Watch echoed the views of this minority and of the major producers' organisations, which published manifestos in El Mercurio, warning of a return to Allende's chaos if the plebiscite failed. If in 2016, Chile still shared with Mexico the dubious honor of being the most unequal country in the world, this was in no small part a product of the success of the Pinochet regime in consolidating its economic agenda through constitutional means. It's through this lens that we should view debates about the status of the human rights defined in the constitution. Defenders of the constitution note that it enshrined more rights than the constitution it replaced, while critics have tended to dismiss these rights as window dressing that entrenched the arbitrary power of Pinochet and the military. For America's Watch, the move to establish a new constitution that limited sovereignty by respect for essential rights originating from human nature was a flawed but nonetheless positive step. From the perspective of my book, human rights were not mere window dressing. Rather, the Pinochet constitution embodied the realization, which the neoliberals had achieved as early as the 40s, that the institutionalization of human rights could prevent political interference with the inequalities of the competitive market and depoliticize civil society. Now, this is most obviously true of Article 24, which proclaims the right of ownership in its diverse aspects over all classes of corporeal and incorporeal property, including rights of private citizens over waters. Or Article 22, which outlaws discrimination in favour of public companies. On closer inspection, even what first appeared to be social and economic rights to health, education and social security are actually rights of private enterprise to compete in offering relevant services on the same terms as the public sector. The right to education, for instance, gives parents the preferential right and duty to educate their children and gives private companies free reign in establishing education providers. The result of these education rights, as their architect Jose Piñera celebrates on his website today, has been the prevalence of private education in Chile. Such rights were based on a blend of neoliberal market ideology with the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, which entailed that the state would fulfill only those functions that could not be fulfilled by intermediate institutions or the private sector. Consequently, the constitution stipulated that educational and other intermediate institutions should be free of politics, and it introduced 
penalties for those who violated this stricture. Going further, it declared it unconstitutional to use or incite political violence or advocate the establishment of a totalitarian system. It was in this context that many on the left began using the language of human rights. Those who remained committed to Marxism found that while they were more likely to escape repression by framing their claims in the language of human rights, making themselves heard in this discursive space required them to adopt a depoliticized legalistic language. At great personal risk, communist militants protested for their rele the release of their relatives and comrades, notably holding a 10-day hunger strike inside the ECLA office in Santiago in 1977. As the regime depicted international communism as a threat to the country's well-being and subjected active communists and labor organizers to torture and disappearance, these militants obscured their political affiliations and presented their demands in neutral humanitarian terms. While they did not initially use the language of human rights, when their protest was portrayed as a human rights campaign by UN figures in the foreign press, they adopted this language, appealing to the Universal Declaration in a letter to the UN General Secretary. While key figures in Pinochet's regime described Marxism as a cancer, human rights, stripped of all relation to political violence, redistribution and revolutionary aspiration, became part of the Christian Western heritage within which these regime figures wished to position Chile. Thus the repeated references in the constitution to dignity, freedom of conscience and human rights. There is no doubt that regime figures were aggravated by the attention of organizations like Amnesty International, which they suggested at various points would be better directed at the Soviet Union or Vietnam. Nonetheless, while the attention of human rights organizations were focused on the regime's violent means, they did not challenge its ends. Today, Chile is not only a highly unequal neoliberal society, it's also a society in which the judiciary has been rehabilitated as human rights NGOs have promoted a new constitutionalism that limits legislative power in the name of human rights. Okay, so just to conclude, in Chile, Amnesty's impartiality and refusal of violence gave it a legitimacy that enabled it to travel the country and speak out against torture and disappearance. But it simultaneously contributed to normalizing a closure of the political imagination and delegitimizing other emancipatory visions. As one sociologist wrote before the recent mass protests, in the face of the depoliticization of Chilean society in the wake of the coup, Human rights is now the sole basis on which a better future can be constructed. In the wake of the junta, torture and disappearance were largely replaced by ongoing human rights trials. Even so, key aspects of the junta's program remained, along with two of its most significant commitments, the subjection of politics to law and a conservative Catholic suspicion of mass politics. One might have expected that the end of the junta and the election of a democratic government would mark a break with the limited or protected democracy introduced by Guzman and supported by his neoliberal allies. But quite the opposite was true. As Fernando Atria noted in 2005, democratic politics is no longer seen as the best insurance against human rights violations, but as the primary danger. As Atria suggested, while in some contexts it may be reasonable to assume that judges should protect individual rights and the constitution from democratic politics, in Chile, whose key problem had been authoritarian anti-democratic tendencies, including in the judiciary, this focus is difficult to justify. It was Pinochet's 1980 constitution that first gave judges a substantial role in adjudicating matters which prior to the coup belonged to the political process. But 2005 amendments to the constitution after the return to democracy dramatically expanded the powers of the constitutional court to determine the constitutionality of legislation in the name of protecting human rights. The consequence was what one Chilean scholar calls an unprecedented willingness by the constitutional court to strike down legislation deemed contrary to the constitution or to international human rights law. <clears throat> 
Today, the courts are increasingly involved in adjudicating matters of health care, tax policy and sexuality rights. Simultaneously, helped logistically by a dense network of international non-governmental organisations, marginalised groups there as elsewhere have been encouraged to channel their struggles through the courts on the assumption that given its rights-oriented ethos, the judiciary will be better able to support the marginalised and subaltern than would the political process. In reality, the results of this process have been deeply disappointing for the most marginalised groups, notably prisoners and Indigenous peoples, as the courts have been unwilling to challenge widespread abuse in the prison system or the continued use of Pinochet-era counter-terror laws against the Mapuche. As intended, in the wake of the dictatorship, the neoliberal program remained in place, while in the name of human rights, Chile's constitutional order restrained democracy and closed down the margin of freedom in ways perhaps Guzman would not have imagined. As Chileans have realized, this constitutional barrier was a key barrier, sorry, this constitutional order was a key barrier to the transformation of their country that they have recently demanded. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much to all of you. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jessica. That was a wonderful, very detailed account of these uh, dynamics. And now, and now I want to give the, the, the stage to uh, Laila and um, and Tessa to see we have some questions from, from the attendance. So we will go directly to that, okay? Hi everyone. So um, I'll just start with the questions that we had in the chat. Um, so one question we had for Jessica was from uh, Gunner. Uh, he says that I read your book last year. Could you elaborate on how your conception of the relationship between human rights and neoliberalism Differs from that of Sam Moin? Sure. Um, yes, I'm happy to. So, Sam Moin has addressed this in a couple of places. Firstly, in an article that was called Powerless Companions about the relationship of human rights to neoliberalism, where he made the argument that human rights NGOs had been essentially powerless companions in the face of the rise of neoliberalism, that they were powerless to prevent its rise, but he strongly contests the idea that they were in some ways complicit with that rise. Um, now, I obviously argue that rather than simply being powerless companions, human rights NGOs were much more implicated in that rise of neoliberalism than Moyn, for instance, recognises there. And in particular, I think that Moyn, like many, thinks about human rights as a moral political discourse or a legal discourse and neoliberalism as an economic discourse. So the problem then becomes how to relate the economic and the moral political. Whereas what I've tried to show is that actually this is a, a false or a very limited understanding of what neoliberalism is and that it's not so much a question of having to relate something called human rights to an economic discourse called neoliberalism but that actually discourses of rights were central to um, neoliberal thinking throughout the 20th century. And that neoliberal thinkers articulated a conception of human rights that actually was then very influential on human rights NGOs. So Moyne's argument that in the 1970s, this distinctive conception of human rights emerged seemingly from nowhere. I'm suggesting that actually, if we look at the history of neoliberal thinking, rather than the history of the United Nations um, human rights process, then we see many of the roots of this conception that came to prominence in the 70s. So just another example of that is that I look at the example of Medicine Sans Frontieres, which is in many ways a much more explicit version than that of Amnesty International in that in the mid eighties, the French leadership of MSF established a think tank or a foundation called Liberty Sans Frontieres. It was essentially the same organization. It had the same leadership as Medicine Sans Frontieres itself. And this organization was explicitly um, developed to challenge third worldism and particularly to contest 
face third worldist demands for a new international economic order and for forms of structural reorganization of the international economy in the wake of colonialism. And so the Medicines Sans Frontier people, for instance, invited Lord Peter Bauer, the most important neoliberal development theorist to come out of the Montpellerin Society to speak at their initial conference. And they took up very, very explicitly many arguments that had been central to neoliberal development discourse and neoliberal discussions about decolonization since at least the 1950s. Um, okay, and uh, we just, we have uh, one person who posed kind of two questions. So I'll just, I'll do the first question. Uh, Nergis says, thank you for this wonderful lecture and discussion. Uh, my question concerns the well-endowed critique of rights struggles in the global south by erudite scholars from the global north, equating them with a naive stance at best and collaboration with neoliberal agendas at worst. Could you elaborate on this asymmetry of speaking on behalf of the subaltern classes globally while still being situated in the north? Sure. Um, look, that's a good question, and it's one that I've given a lot of consideration to, but I would want to resist, if I'm understanding the question correctly, that critiques of human rights come simply from the North, while struggles for human rights come simply from the global South. Many of the thinkers that I've been most influenced in the book are themselves speaking from the global South um, and have developed very strong critiques of the kind of human rights politics um, that has um, been particularly manifested by NGOs in the global North. Um, so people like Upendra Bakhti, Bakshi, um, Makar Matua, um, there are a whole range of figures um, who I draw on in the book uh, who have made these kinds of <coughs> critiques. So I think that there is a, a complex dynamic there, but I don't think that it's the case that we simply have defences of human rights in the global south and critiques coming from the global north. Okay, I hope, I hope that um, answered your question, Nargis. And then the second part of Nargis's, uh, or the second question she had was, would it not make sense to see the uh, usurpation of the rights discourse by con conservative movements and uh, corporatist traditions, rather than reducing all rights struggles to such a demeaning stance? Okay, so maybe I need to make clear that in the book, I certainly don't suggest, and I did say this here, but I'll expand upon it. I don't make the argument that all human rights struggles are neoliberal, nor do I make the argument that human rights have always everywhere been neoliberal. In fact, much of the book is about contestations over human rights. And so I devote, for instance, a lot of attention to the context of the drafting of the human rights covenants, where anti-colonial um, movements and post-colonial diplomats succeeded in having the right of nations to self-determination listed as the first human right in those covenants. And I look at the way that this was an agenda that the neoliberal thinkers absolutely mobilized against. So I do think that human rights has been a field of argument and tension and conflict and that numerous different conceptions of human rights exist and have existed. On the other hand, I don't think it's just a matter of conservatives um, sort of usurping human rights discourse. I think that they were developing ideas of human rights you know, from the moment, if we just look at the 20th century for now, as early as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being drafted, neoliberal thinkers were also discussing and debating the conception of human rights themselves. And I do think that their conception of human rights is today much more influential than is often acknowledged. But I mean, I, I'm not making the argument that all human rights politics are neoliberal. Thank you. Thanks very much. No problem. Uh, okay, so our next question comes from uh, Sam. Uh, he says, greetings, Jessica from Palestine. Brilliant insights. Thank you. Um, looking forward to reading the book, given Palestine today may very well be the most recent poster child for your arguments. Have you looked at the Palestine case? Mm. Um, look, yes, and 
thank you very much for being here. Um, it's a case that, um, you know, I've thought about quite a bit, partly because I have family in Palestine and um, I've seen the way that a sort of completely neoliberalized regime, a completely privatized regime um, impacts on people's lives. Um, I haven't looked at it in relation to neoliberal thinkers, although um, they did at various points. Hayek, for instance, um, wrote numerous letters about how he would recommend solving the problem of uh, Palestine and of Jerusalem um, to various Israeli regimes, which were promptly ignored. But um, I think you're right that this is a, a case that is a profound example of a couple of things that I think are really important. One is the absolute neoliberalization and attempt to use market dynamics to create social atomization and political breakdown and depoliticize um, a society. And also, I think, through the discourse of economic peace that, for instance, Netanyahu is particularly associated with, but which we have seen being revived in the context of the so-called deal of the century, that the idea that politics can be completely bypassed in favour of an economic peace agreement that will create some kind of broader peace through commerce, which I think is a, a fantasy. It's a fantasy there probably more so than it is in other places. But I think that we're certainly seeing many of the dynamics that I think are key to the neoliberal situation, including the, the extraordinary violence which, with, with which it is imposed. Okay, I think next we have a hand raised. So Connie, would you like to raise your question? Okay, well, then we have another question from the chat. Um, the question is from Alan and it's, do you see legitimate role for judicial review or is it hopelessly compromised by its position within the structure of the liberal legalist state? If you look at it, it seems that many important changes towards emancipation have come from the courts and not legislatures. Yeah, I mean, the reason that I use that um those remarks from Fernando Atria at the end of what I presented today about the anti-democratic tendencies in the judiciary in Chile is to suggest that I'm not making a blanket argument in the current context. Like there's, there's questions about a broader emancipatory ideal, but right now I'm not saying get rid of all judicial review. But what I am saying is that in the Chilean context in particular, where you had the judiciary completely implicated in the authoritarianism of the regime to then assume that in the return to democracy, the judiciary should be responsible for um, any kind of guardianship of marginalised and subaltern populations is mistaken. I mean, this is not to discredit um, certain forms of legal activism in Australia, also particularly in relation to our uh, border regimes, um, judicial review of government um, decisions around exclusion of asylum seekers, excising of islands, um, mandatory detention have been quite important, but that's also created enormous problems of political struggles that get completely directed to the courts as the one avenue of any form of emancipatory struggle. So I think that these are complex and contextual questions. Um, and I'm not trying to make an argument that um, what is true in Chile is necessarily true in every case. I think this is for political actors in particular cases. But obviously, as the concept note um, suggests, the turn to law imposes particular logics on political struggles, particular forms of expertise, particular forms of discourse. And I think that they need to be taken. Sorry, someone's just started mowing the lawn or something outside. Um, I think that those dynamics have to be taken really seriously when any political struggle thinks about recourse to the courts. Okay. So I think Connie is going to ask her question now. Connie? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I wanted to ask it um, verbally because I'm a little bit um, not certain about my phrasing, but basically when I was in my early 20s, I worked a lot. Um, a lot of the work I did relied 
we relied heavily on appealing to this sort of like Western human rights framework with Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we, there was an awareness of like the way in which these frameworks are very Western and limited in nature, but we thought these were the power structures that were in place and this is the way that we could access th this power and try to get people to pay attention because these were the things that they were interested in and these were the ways that we could sort of leverage some of that power for um, our work for, for, for us in, in Southeast Asia, right? But now that I'm, I'm like in my early thirties, I'm becoming like increasingly uncomfortable with the like unintended externalities of this sort of, um, this, this sort of um, tools, I guess. And the, because I, I look at the rhetoric um, that we sort of feed into to do the work and I'm not quite sure what the balance is anymore between like um, what's going to come about even if we do sort of reach the goals that we want to, what are we going to, how do we get there and what's going to come about as sort of like the unintended byproducts of us getting there, right? And that's really hard um, and I'm not really sure what to do about that. And I was just wondering if you guys, if you, since you've spent so much time thinking about this, had any thoughts about how to address that? Um, look, thanks. And it's, I mean, it's a very large question and it's a question that really, I mean, you have to answer in your particular context. Um, I guess what I think that my book can do is just provide some historical account of the way the particular human rights project that say an organization like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch represents uh, competed with and displaced other forms of political movements. So really central to my account is the, the period of decolonization because I think that it hasn't been talked about enough that it was really in a context of decolonization that neoliberal thinkers became particularly concerned about the regulation of the international sphere. They were terrified that um, decolonization would lead not just to political independence, which most of them weren't particularly concerned about, but that it would also lead to challenges to the global division of labor and to the forms of colonial extraction that had been taken for granted throughout that point. So I think that the kind of politics that neoliberal thinkers took up and that often influenced human rights NGOs was one that had its antagonists and had very strong and powerful antagonists, um, particularly in the period of decolonization. So I guess um, to me, there's not a single solution, but there is a need to, to think through what's at stake and what kind of history is taken up when we take up a particular model of human rights that came to prominence in a particular period that took on certain influences, including strong neoliberal influences. And so to think about whether those, what you called the sort of negative externalities are not just contingent externalities, but are in fact central to the model of human rights campaigning that those those NGOs represent. Okay, um, I do have a question uh, from Emilio. So uh, at the end of the book, you say that the current neoliberal state of affairs suggests that the project of subordinating politics to human rights norms and transferring governance to international financial bodies has failed to create more inclusive and equal polities. And rather than seeking to transcend, uh, transcend politics by recourse to morality, markets or law, the inequalities of our time call for the reinvigoration of political contestation over ends. Our question is, is that possible? And what is the role of law in that? Uh, don't you think that neoliberalism may have failed to produce more just societies if it was ever its intention, but has succeeded in the transformation of subjectivities and therefore seems to be efficiently administer dissent? 
or said otherwise, do you think that Alan Bedou is right when he says that the obstacle for transformative politics is not so much the objective conditions which uh, are there, uh, but that what is actually missing are the subjective conditions. Maybe neoliberalism was a success. Thank you. Um, look, that's a great question and there's an enormous amount in there. One of the things that um, I would say and perhaps my phrasing there is not clear because I certainly don't think that the neoliberal thinkers ever aimed to produce more equal societies and failed at doing so. I think that they actually had a fundamental commitment, a normative commitment to inequality as a basic good. So in that sense, I think that the forms of inequality that are being witnessed today are certainly not a failure of neoliberal policies. They're a success of those neoliberal policies in many ways. But one of the things that I do think has changed is if you look back today at speeches by Tony Blair or Bill Clinton, the kind of euphoria about what neoliberal regimes and neoliberalization of societies would supposedly mean in bringing about a better future for people, I think is one that barely anyone really subscribes to today. So I really notice it about my students that they're deeply worried about their futures. They know that their chances of having a better sort of standard of living than their parents are very slim, that they have far less chance of finding a job, that they have less chance of ever being able to afford to buy a house. And I think that some of the utopia that is, was associated with neoliberalism has really faded in the current context. On the other hand, I think that the question that you raise about subjectivity is really fundamental. And it's certainly fundamental to my book in that what I'm particularly interested in is the way that the neoliberal thinkers saw it as fundamental to produce what Hayek talked about as submission to the market order, the creating a submissive form of subjectivity was absolutely central as a support to the market order. So it was any break with that submission that they saw as what was threatened by, uh, sorry, as what threatened the market order. So they believed that human rights could help to um, implement and to be conducive to that form of submission. And I mentioned in the talk that Arnold Harberger's claim that the problem in Chile was excessive romanticism. And these kind of ideas were really fundamental amongst many of the neoliberal thinkers where for them, the barriers to good economics were not objective, whatever objective would be, but they were fundamentally um, subjective barriers. So Harberger, who was responsible for training generations of economists at the Chicago School across Latin America, said very explicitly that the real problem in Chile, and it was this sort of racialized idea also that he had where Chileans are... Um, romantic, they're overly influenced by Rousseauian totalitarian ideas, they're always willing to blame their problems on someone else, on some structural cause. And he says it's very different with Asians. Asians just accept everything as fate and they just get on and take personal responsibility. So for the neoliberal thinkers, it was creating a form of uh, subjectivity that would not challenge the uh, sort of allocation of possibilities and of resources through the market that was really central. Now, whether that process has been so successful that neoliberalism is not challengeable today, it's a really uh, important and fundamental question. And I think that there are certainly examples that keep popping up, including recently in Chile with the um, struggles to rewrite the constitution that I think give me some hope. But I also think, yes, the, the sense that while people may no longer feel that um, neoliberalism offers them a brighter future, that nonetheless the, the routes to that future are through individual responsibility, struggle and competition is very entrenched in our societies and certainly poses a real challenge to um, any kind of emancipatory or anti-capitalist politics. All right, so we're down to the final two questions. 
Um, this one's from Mathilde. She says, hello, Jessica. Thank you so much for these very interesting insights. I particularly appreciated your development on how the Pinochet constitution in Chile embodied the neoliberal project of a society and of the individual. You made clear not all human rights discourse are neoliberal. And I was wondering in light of the context of the writing of a new constitution, do you think it has the potential to embody substantial structural changes, or do you think it is somehow condemned to embrace the neoliberal atmosphere in Chile, despite the rise of a solid social movement? I was thinking particularly to the rights of the indigenous communities. Do they have the potential to some form of emancipation within the new constitution? Um, thank you. Uh, look, I think I wouldn't say that um, any political movement is condemned in advance. I think that the, the efforts that went into finally overturning and um, achieving the rewriting of this uh, constitution are quite extraordinary. It was never meant to happen. I mean, the whole point of this constitution was that whenever the junta disappeared, whenever democracy returned, ultimately nothing would change because the constitutional order would ensure that nothing would change. Now, this doesn't mean that simply rewriting a constitution is going to overcome all Chile's problems or the problems of any other society. I don't believe that, but I think there are nonetheless the, the fact that people have identified the constitution as a serious barrier for change and the extent to which they have been successful in uh, pushing for and succeeding in um, achieving the rewriting of that constitution is a hopeful sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so we have the final question from Federico. Uh, he says, many thanks, Jessica, for your presentation and dear colleagues from the Nathanson Center for this event. Can you please refer to what do you think about economic policies of Joe Biden in the US if he thinks if he is going, is he going to preserve neoliberal policies in the US and overseas or is he going to implement some change to this realm? I guess my quick answer to this, is going to preserve neoliberal policies in the US so and overseas would be yes. Um, I have very little hope for the Biden administration, I have to say, and I think that it's very interesting that in the period in which they've been discussing a minimum wage, he's also, um, you know, quietly without much fanfare, um, again, been bombing Syria. So I think that um, certainly we're seeing changes and I think that the particular way that the Trump Trump administration um, operated particularly in that region in relation to Iran, the Saudis and Israel is undergoing some, um, some transformation, some kind of realignment. And I think that the recent uh, US bombing of Syria is part of that. Um, but I don't think that this is one which gives any sense that the United States is no longer um, going to be entrenching very regressive economic agendas on a global level. Um, and I think we're coming up to a very, um, you know, a very conflictual time, certainly being in Australia, the emerging Cold War with China is everywhere around us um, and the kinds of conflicts that that is starting to produce in all sectors of society are very stark. So I, um, whether I have hope for Biden, no, I don't, but I think that we are um, entering a, a sort of a period in which a whole... Uh, a sort of a whole era that was marked by the Fukuyama end of history and the Margaret Thatcher no alternative is reaching its end. I think that as much as numerous US pundits are nostalgic for a previous United States role in a unipolar world, that that role cannot be revived, whether the United States wants to or not. So I think that we are coming into a new political situation. And I hope that as well as obviously bringing with it significant new dangers that it also brings with it some new political possibilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. We are getting at the end of this first session. Actually, it was a wonderful, I, I think, a wonderful session. Your work and your book were an excellent introduction to to the seminar and the objectives of the seminar. And, and I just have to, I want to, uh, on behalf of Nathanson, uh, 
center to thank you and the audience, all the people who joined and stayed until the end. We are at two hours now. So, so the last thing I, I would say is that uh, next time we will be in the month of April, we will be um, hosting uh, Nicola Peruccini that Jessica knows, I, I understand, with his last book on called Human Chills, People in the Line of Fire. For now, I just want to thank Jessica again and everyone uh, for this wonderful session. Thank you, Laila, Tessa, Elham, and, um, and Heidi for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.